Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our final garden hour for the year, uh, brought to you each week by SDSU Extension. I'm Rhoda Burroughs, SDSU Extension horticulturist, and I will be your host for this final evening. Tonight's panelists will include Christine Lang, Consumer Horticulture Extension Specialist, Christina Lind, Horticulture Outreach Consultant for McCrory Gardens, and Amanda Bachman, Pesticide Education and Urban Entomology Field Specialist. Christine, what are you going to be uh, telling us about tonight? Well, Rhoda, I'm going to be sharing some ways that we can pivot our annual and perennial beds to fall and activities we should be doing to wrap up the season. And last but not least, of course, I'll have to show one last photo of my own garden. <laughs> and Amanda, what kind of creepy crawly things do we have in store tonight? <laughs> well, I've got some general commentary about some of the plants that I've seen out in the wild supporting pollinators uh, during this late season time. And then also just kind of a roundup of a bunch of the insects that we've talked about so far this year. We look forward to it. I'm going to start tonight with uh, talking about uh, how to preserve some of your or to keep your your uh, garden produce a little bit longer, uh, kind of a continuation of of one of our previous subjects. And there we go. So uh, it's a time of year when people are starting to worry about frost and worrying about bringing in tomatoes to finish ripening uh, in indoors. Um, here we've already had a little bit of frost in the southeast part of the state. Um, it's 90 degrees here today, so it's, that's kind of hard to imagine, but it will come for all of us. Uh, tomatoes will ripen off the vine as long as they've started turning that sort of lighter green color. We call that the breaker stage at which uh, if it's left long enough in the proper conditions, it can go ahead and ripen. And of course, we know that's how a lot of the store-bought tomatoes are actually harvested green and then and then ripened up. Uh, so, so we can, you don't all, you don't have to use all your green tomatoes in, in green tomato pie or whatever it might be. Uh, you can go ahead and ripen those as well. There are a number of ways to do this. And often I have somebody say, well, I'm going to bring them in and put them in my nice sunny window. That actually is not a good way to ripen them. The sunshine actually will do more damage than good. The tomato needs needs warmth and time. It does not need sunshine in order to ripen. So uh, don't worry about trying to get them into sunlight. Just find a nice, warm, dry place for them to be. Uh, one option is to uh, wrap them in newspaper uh, and put them in a box. They'll keep for quite a while that way put the green ones uh, on the bottom and the riper ones on the top so that so that uh, you get them as they ripen. Um, if you're trying to ripen them a little bit quicker, we can do what, what I've been telling you not to do, which is put the apples or bananas in with them. That gives off that natural ethylene, which is how uh, tomatoes are ripened commercially anyway. Uh, but that will hasten the ripening. So you, you could put it in a in a in a paper bag with with tomatoes and, and a banana in it or an apple in it, and and that will ripen them within a few days as opposed to maybe a, a few weeks. So that's one trick to doing it as well. Uh, another way that some people like to do, if you're getting into cold weather is to just pull the whole plant up out of the soil and hang it like you were drying herbs or something like that and, and let them ripen actually on the vine, but the vine is detached from the soil at that point. So that's another way that, that people have found works well for them. 
uh, winter squash and pumpkins. Uh, again, a fingernail should not penetrate easily into winter squash or pumpkins. So if you're selecting them somewhere uh, and you want them to keep for a while, uh, if they are fully mature, your fingernail should not go into that squash or pumpkin very easily. Uh, one thing to look for is this uh, sort of uh, where, the, where the stem is no longer totally green, it, it's got some corking on it, we call it. Uh, that's a signal that the plant is getting ready to separate the fruit from the vine. So that's another uh, indicator of maturity. So you can kind of look for that at on some of your squash or your pumpkins. If it's totally still green and, and lush looking, it's probably not ready yet. On acorn squash, we look for the orange ground spot, kind of like the yellow ground spot on watermelons, only, only it's more orangish on acorn squash. Um, and know that most winter squash, unlike summer squash, most winter squash will ripen further after picking. So if you have to pick your pumpkins when they're not totally orange yet, bring them indoors and they will ripen some and, and often turn totally orange. So uh, all is not lost if, if you were late getting planted this year and, and they're not quite ready yet. Um, butternut squash, which we have pictured here, the quality is actually best a couple months after harvest. So uh, once it's harvested and brought in indoors, if you've got good keeping, uh, a good place to keep it, it actually develops more flavor and more sugars uh, as it ripens indoors. So uh, acorn squash, you want to use pretty much right away. It won't keep real long and it's got better quality to start with. But but some of these other uh, winter squashes actually can age some for best quality. How, how's the best way to keep winter squash and pumpkins? First of all, cut them from the vine. Don't, don't tear them from the vine because the what we call the handle or the stem uh, will come off and that's a place that that rot could get started. So it's protective to leave that handle on and, and cut it from the vine. Then if you can find the space that you have that you can keep it eh, from like 75 to 85 degrees for any time from a few days up to a couple of weeks, maybe even three weeks, uh, that rind will harden further. Uh, the stem will sort of seal off a little bit more. Um, and that will help keep those squash for much longer than if you just took it and, and took it right into where, wherever your storage is. 50 to 60 degrees long term is going to keep it uh, the best. So if you happen to have an old cellar, that's wonderful. Uh, it will keep it for a long time in there. If you don't, uh, one option might be to put it directly on your basement floor if you don't have a carpet in your basement and gets the cool from the from the ground beneath. Um, so those are some options there. Again, do not store near apples. Again, apples give off that ripening compound, bananas, the same thing. Uh, but you're less likely to put bananas in your basement than you might eat your apples. Uh, but apples will give off that ripening compound. And so uh, your, your squash and pumpkins could get overripe uh, a lot more quickly. So want to keep them away from the apples. We have a poll tonight. If Evan can put it up for us. And I have to stop. There we are. So uh, just a fun quiz for you all. Uh, thought we'd put up some trivia tonight. Mount Rushmore, Meadowlark, Valiant, and Luscious are, are they SDSU ice cream names, plants we've talked about on Garden Hour, or are they plants that were bred or released uh, by SDSU? So you can click on on what you think the answer might be.
I'm just going to give them the full minute. Okay. All right. Five, four, <laughs> three, two, one. Last chance, everybody, to make a last minute guess. Oh, oh, all right. End of the poll. Here are our results. Nobody bid on the ice cream game, huh? <laughs> and it looks like the majority of you uh, were correct. These were plants that were bred or released by SDSU. Um, I have talked about Valiant Grape, I believe, on, on Garden Hour. I'm not sure if I've talked about Luscious. That's a pear that was released by Ron Peterson. Uh, Mount Rushmore uh, was a tomato, and uh, that was released by Paul Prasher. And Meadowlark is a forsythia, um, and that was a joint release between North Dakota and South Dakota. It was, uh, uh, Good for all of you that got it correct. I'm afraid we don't have any prizes, but but uh, uh, you can give yourself a pat on the back. You get satisfaction. That's your pride. That's right. So do we have any questions tonight yet? If I decide to ripen my green tomatoes with a banana or apple, should I wrap the green tomatoes in newspaper? You know, if you wrap them loosely, I think they would probably still get the the flame. But if in doubt, you could put them put them on newspaper, uh, on a, in a box, and then put the apple or banana in with them, and then just put another loose layer of of uh, newspaper over the top of that. And I think that's. That's it for now. Um, notice that there is a uh, link in the chat on storing pumpkins in winter squash on our website. So if you wanted further information or you didn't want to write down the information, uh, you can go to that link. With that, I think I will turn it over to Christine. All right, good evening, everyone. First, um, for our master gardeners on the call, thank you so much for those of you who joined us for the 2021 Master Gardener Update in Huron. It was a lot of fun. Um, we talked about everything from tomatoes. Christina talked about plant propagation, and we had a great discussion about daylilies um, from Paul Owen from North Carolina. So it was a great event, and just thanks to those of you who joined us. And for those of you that are like, that sounds fun, we would love to have you join Master Gardeners next year, and you, could, you too could come to the Master Gardener Update. All right. So uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about pivoting to fall Whoops. and um, no worries. My first slide, the photo on the right should be titled Christine is tired of watering. Um, there are certain <laughs> certain things in my raised beds that were starting to, you know, they were looking a little bit tired. I had avoided or neglected deadheading for a while and they were just looking worn out and, you know, drying up every day because the root systems are so large. And I thought, you know what, I'm gonna take some things out of my annual raised beds and just move some pots around. So I, I just wanna give everyone else in the room permission. If you're tired of watering things or you have annuals that are starting to decline, even though we haven't had a hard freeze yet, feel free to start taking those things out, especially um, with containers. If you wanna replace things with pumpkins or corn stalks, or pull out some of those other cool season annuals. I know many of our garden centers, of course, you're gonna see a lot of pansies being sold, a lot of beautiful ornamental kales. We saw a beautiful ornamental kale from Christina Lind last week at McCrory. Um, and realizing that some of our some of our annuals are gonna to tolerate cooler temperatures than others. For example, in the right-hand photo, I incorporated Swiss chard in my raised beds and that's gonna tolerate cooler temperatures than some of my other annuals. So I'm hoping to get a few more harvests from that this fall. And the last thing on this slide, 
I do have the picture of the yellow chrysanthemums. Of course, we can't walk past a grocery store or garden center or basically anywhere that sells stuff right now without seeing all sorts of beautiful chrysanthemums to bring home. And those are a great filler. You can um, certainly just set them, set them on your steps or put them in a container. You can dig them into your garden. I just wanna note that a lot of the chrysanthemums we're buying, especially if it's a grab and take at our you know, grocery store or something like that, there's a good chance that those aren't going to be winter hardy for our area, which isn't to say they're not a beautiful option for fall. Definitely um, enjoy all of those bright, beautiful colors, but realizing um, that you'd want to look for named varieties that list the hardiness zone if it is a chrysanthemum that you wanted to plant and keep, keep over winter. And that would be something you would want to dig and get into your garden now. Um, so there's time for it to establish and realizing that, especially if it's in full brilliant bloom, but it is a hardy chrysanthemum, it still put a lot of energy into those blooms and um, may have a, a little bit of trouble rutting in. But so pay attention to hardiness zones. The yellow Chrysanthemum featured here is from the Mammoth series. I believe this is Yellow Quill. And it, um, the Mammoth series was developed by the University of Minnesota. So if you see Mammoth in the name, um, those are all their line and those are nice and hardy. And this was a photo I took from McCrory Gardens a few weeks ago. So they were all look, ready looking lovely. So, all right, the next slide. Um, with with our garden chores, um, it's important to think about what tender bulbs are not going to be able to overwinter in our containers and especially in our garden soils here in South Dakota. So some really good examples of this. Again, just had to put another photo from my deck. This was earlier this summer the when the canna was in full bloom and the hummingbirds were approaching it and happy to see it. And the dahlia is one of the dahlias from McCrory Gardens. I don't know the name, but perhaps Christina will be able to help us out in the chat. Um, so cannas, dahlias, and gladiolus are all good examples of um, tender bulb plants that aren't going to overwinter in the ground here. So um, you can leave these in your garden through the first frost and let the frost take out those stems. And at that point, kind of use that as your, your starting line, so to speak, for digging those out. Um, with cannas, you should see underground stems, kind of elongated rhizomes. With dahlias, they're gonna be tuberous, so their roots are gonna look similar to a potato. And with gladiolus, they're actually a corm, so it's kind of a compressed looking stem. So you're gonna to wanna to dig that out. Um, for those cannas and those dahlias, it's good to wash that soil off. Um, with the gladiolus, it's better to just leave that soil on there and not disturb those corms. And for all of these, um, it's recommended to use a curing process. So let those rhizomes and tubers sit out for about three days at 60 to 70 degrees so that the skin kind of dries off and um, hardens on the outside. And with those corms, it's actually recommended to let them dry for about three weeks. And remember, we haven't knocked that soil off. So after it's dried for those three weeks, you can knock that soil off. And then all of these can be stored. You wanna find a cool, dry area between 40 and 50 degrees is recommended. Um, for example, you could put them in garden flats or some sort of an open container, kind of nest them in some um, maybe lightly moistened peat moss. You don't want things to stay wet. And you, I would not recommend putting these in a sealed container where um, there's a chance that excessive moisture could build up and you could have issues with rotting. And these can all be planted out in the spring when the soils start to warm. So um, my canna that's in my container, I'm going to go ahead and overwinter that and hopefully I'll have a picture of how it looks in the spring. All right, we're going to stick with the theme of garden cleanup. So next slide, Rhoda. Tomorrow, actually, um, we, we, I say myself and some of our wonderful horticulture students here in Brookings at SDSU, we're going to be heading out to McCrory Gardens and we're going to be working with, um, with the garden plot that you see on the left. So again, I said I'm kind of sick of watering, but again, based on how big your gardens are and how much you have to do, it is the time to start thinking about what annuals you might want to be taking out of the garden. And the students are gonna be helping me tomorrow. This was the All-American Selections Trial Garden. We've collected all of the data and had all the information we need. 
And as you can see, these zinnias, um, you maybe can't tell very well, but they should have looked a much, a lot uh, darker green. And the reason their color is so muted partly is because of powdery mildew. So we're gonna get all of that foliage and all of that root and plant material out of there so that there isn't any, um, so that there's a lower chance of powdery mildew being carried over um, to that site next year. And then not included in the photo, but a little further to the right were all of the sunflowers. Now I've noticed when I've been out there um, that the birds have been enjoying and picking at those seeds. So one thing to think about with your annual gardens, you know, before you start taking all of your plants out and, you know, composting or discarding that material, um, if there is still, if you're noticing that the birds are really using it or you still have annuals that are in bloom um, that pollinators are visiting, and I'm sure Amanda will speak to this as well, but if you have things that are in bloom and look beautiful and you can leave them in the garden for as long as possible to help out our insect and bird friends, please do so. Um, but for example, with these zinnias, they're, they're done blooming. They've had powdery mildew. We're gonna be taking those out of the garden. And those same lessons really translate um, to a perennial cleanup as well. Um, if you want to start trimming back perennials that are done blooming and the foliage is already dying back, um, I'm thinking about hostas this year. We, I've seen a lot of photos of sun scorch, um, leaf scorch on hostas. If you've got hostas that are looking really tough and you wanna start trimming them back, um, I would say it's safe to do so. If the plant has still got a lot of green tissue, um, it is nice to wait until the first frost to let those plants photosynthesize as much as possible because that allows them to store up more sugars for the winter, which um, helps with those robust root systems and for overwintering. Um, so feel free with perennials to wait till the frost. And then it's always the question of, do I cut everything back to the ground? Do I leave some things over winter? What should I do? And in true extension fashion, it depends. Um, you know, with beautiful ornamental grasses that have a lot of winter interest, feel free to leave those standing. The rutabecchia and echinacea that you see here um, on the photo on the right, um, they have interesting seed heads. Those are gonna be dried stems. Again, the birds might peck at it and there again is some winter interest. So that might be something you choose to leave in your garden versus I'm gonna pick on sedums. When they get hit with, once they freeze out and start to die back, that tissue is gonna really kind of become mushy and just kind of cave in on itself. So that's a good example of something that you could pull out for the season. Um, if you've had perennials that have given you some trouble with overwintering in the past, don't be afraid to leave that foliage as just a little bit of, um, extra mulch, if you will. It will catch other leaves and debris and snowfall and just provide a little bit of extra cover. And you can come back in the spring and clip that down to the ground. But some of it is, you know, timing your garden chores and thinking about how much you have to do. Um, another advantage of leaving some stems and some foliage is you'll create habitat for insects, which I'll have, I'll ask Amanda to speak to a little bit more in our Q&A time. Um, and the only other thing I was going to say about perennial garden cleanup is if you have plants, again, let's, I'm going to pick on phlox. If you've had phlox, for example, that's had a lot of powdery mildew, I would recommend getting, um, getting that trimmed back as close to the ground this fall. Again, so, pow so there's less um, powdery mildew spores that are in overwintering structures that give you problems next spring. So pay attention if you have diseased plants, I would definitely remove, um, remove that foliage down to the ground this fall if at all possible. And with that, um, for my last slide, uh, we've already indicated that tonight is our last garden hour for the season and we just, you know, I just wanna personally thank you for, for joining us week over week. And it's been fun seeing you and seeing you virtually when I've been on the show. And I wanna let you know that um, if you're looking for more fall gardening information from, from this group, we are gonna run the yard and garden news or garden and yard newsletter. We're gonna have a release of the newsletter on October 5th and uh, October 19th. 
So we will have two more fall issues and you can always find all of our extension articles on the garden and yard page of extension.sdstate.edu. So feel free to look for that information there. And you know we look forward to hearing from you and we look forward to seeing all of you at some, some winter programming. We'll, we'll definitely be releasing some things. So stay tuned for news on that. Thank you, Christine. We do have one question. Uh, is it too late to divide iris? Um, I would say if you were going to divide irises, it should have been done a little bit earlier in the season, considering how it's been slower leading up to freeze and how warm our soils continue to be. You could definitely give it a shot. Um, but we're kind of getting past that window of optimum. Yes, I would definitely go out and divide those irises. So if you feel like you can wait till next year, that would not hurt. <laughs> All right, um, some of you may have seen in the chat, we had an answer about the dahlias um, and it was kind of a mixture of dinner plates. So I don't know exactly which one that was, but. It was beautiful. Right. Yes, thank you, Christina. Dinner plate came to mind, so thank you for confirming that because I didn't want to give the wrong thing. <laughs> and next up, we have Christina uh, with our McCrory Garden, uh, some beautiful photos for the week. Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to start to screen, uh, share my screen in just a second. Um, because I have a bunch of really beautiful <laughs> pictures of the garden and a little bit of a review of some of our, some of our favorite ones from the year or some of, I guess, my favorite ones from the year. So let's, here we go and start slideshow. So right here to start with, um, these are just some things that I noticed out today we were doing a doing a fun um, floral arranging workshop in the gardens. Um, so I definitely keep your eyes out for that because they're gonna be doing another one. Um, a friend of mine, really talented floral arranger, um, Liz Ad, with her um, new floral arranging business um, is going to be leading a, going to be leading um, a workshop on floral arranging in the gardens. And we just did one today as well. And the next one is going to be October 10th, so for our fall festival. So watch McCrory Gardens website and social media and everything about their fall festival. It's going to be a lot of really fun stuff. I think it's dog days and food trucks and um, the floral arranging and free admission and uh, just, um, gosh, I know I'm forgetting things, but definitely check it out because there's a lot of, a lot of things going on for that for that fall festival. Um, but during these floral arranging workshops, it's really fun because we get to walk around the gardens and harvest, um, kind of use McCrory Gardens as your um, source of material for your arrangement. And um, so you can come up with some really, really beautiful things where we um, snip from the gardens themselves. So keep an eye out for that. So I, we were out there today and I got some photos of some really beautiful things like this American hazelnuts. I love the hazelnuts and they just get this really lovely color. Plus if you can beat the squirrels to the hazelnuts, then you have that treat as well. So um, that's one of my favorites to look out for in the gardens. Just, this is just kind of a showstopper that every time the castor beans are, you know, this is, I mean, there's probably actually even bigger ones out there. That's again, my daughter for the size comparison, comparison but it's, um, she's again, about four feet tall. So that's probably eight feet tall, at least that plant. And you can see how big just one leaf is. It looks like a dinosaur plant, or it reminds me if anybody's ever seen the, um, land before time, the like star flower. <laughs> anyway, it is, the seeds are poisonous, but you, you, um, they're not really something that looks like anything you'd want to eat. So it generally is not going to be a problem for you. Um, and it does have a really hard shell as well that would have to be perforated for it to be any danger, but it's got a actually really cool seed. You can kind of see it. It's spiky and funky, but so that's the castor beans, the and pagoda dogwoods. 
Um, this one is in a lot of fall color that I'm not sure if that one actually might be, um, be quite farther along than a lot of others, but, um, they have sort of this really cool tiered effect, um, and they get really lovely blooms in the spring. So it's not technically in bloom, but again, it just looks really nice right now. These Patagoda dogwoods. Um, so they're kind of a fun fall, fall color favorite. Petronia, um, it's just one that I don't see very often. So I like to highlight it. It's got this yellowish um flower that is works really nice um in oh, again we use a lot of it for our floral arranging and things like that it can volunteer but it's not like aggressive about it just kind of one or two here or there that at least in my experience with the plant um the petrinia scabiosa folia so that's there in the perennial garden and been there for a number of years and i've always kind of admired it every year so then just annual displays. Look at this. this was today and it's just looks fabulous. <laughs> and so you can see some of the um, compact cranberry bush there, the compact viburnum on the right is starting to get into that red fall robes. And there that's the ornamental kale um, that I mentioned in a previous week. You can see just how glowing it is. And also salvia in the back. I love those purples. Um, and I think I actually included them in highlight reel from weeks past, which I'll try to kind of skim through quickly. But I kind of wanted to do highlights since it's our last week of some of the ones our favorites. So early on in the year, um, we had our roses, like this campfire rose with thousands of colors on one plant and <laughs> covered in blooms. And then the easy L and that's the first editions. And then we also have the easy elegance, my girl, which is the bottom, right? That's the bottom too. Um, that's just kind of always glossy and green and lovely and, um, blooming. Oops. I, I move that. Yep. There we go. Poppies. This was early on in the season too. This, the Oriental, Oriental pop, poppy. And that the one on the right is the flamenco dancer. The other one, I actually don't know the exact, but it's a, Pop, Pepper Oriental. And just those are really fun spring, spring bloomer for you. Mock orange is that top right up there. Just smells amazing. And I think this is sometime in June that that was uh, blooming or possibly that could have been into July. Um, and then on the left and bottom, um, the Northern Catalpa, which you can just see how it's just a, such a showy, beautiful tree. We just planted one at my home on here on the farm this, this year. And I can't wait till it's big like that and blooms like that for me. Um, Liatris. I just, um, I like all kinds of Liatris, but this one's a Spicata um, Kobold, but there's just so many cultivars of that. Um, Rebecca's and Echinaceas. Um, here's that flowering kale, the pigeon purple. Um, and there's all kinds of flowering kale for um, anybody who's interested in those that they kind of withstand that frost late in the season. So they're really nice right now. That salvia from that bed. Again, this is just, I will recommend that one again, that mealy, mealy cup sage, the blue better. That'll always be, I think, one of my go-to filler kind of tall blue plants. I just, I just love adding that to my annual beds. Purple prairie clover a very, very favorite um, native from this area. That's just such a cool looking plant. And I just love that little bee. <laughs> Paul and sack on his legs. So the miscanthus, it's still looking lovely. This miscanthus sinensis gold silva, the red silver grass. It's wonderful. That is definitely one that I recommend to anyone. It's like one, you know, I think it looks good kind of from the beginning to the end, but it looks fabulous right now. And that stays standing pretty tall and strong throughout the winter. So it, um, I like that winter interest and habitat. And, whatnot. and that Rebecca from last week, the, the Henry Eilers. I just think that's a neat one. I wanted to highlight one more time. Um, bottle gentian. I don't know if you guys remember seeing that one, but it's so cool. Another native um, perennial that we also find on the Blue Dasher Prairie out here that it's it's a little bit more shrubby, especially this year in the dry year, but such a cool, such a cool native perennial. And as you can see, it grows successfully in a well-maintained garden. Some of those natives, I find that 
almost have a hard time in a really rich maintained soil, but this one does fabulous in that kind of environment. So yeah, those are my highlights. Um, stay in touch with McCrory Gardens, um, follow us on social media and um, you can you can email or um, you can contact Lori at 6707 um, is the phone number up there. Or myself, you can follow at um, cjoy at, um, I'm on Instagram and stuff like that. I sometimes post pictures like this, cjoy at Blue Dasher Farm, if you want to follow me as well. And we hope to stay in touch. So thank you all. Does anybody have questions, I guess, before I hop off? Not yet. Okay. Well, very good. I'll stay on for a little bit. And if I miss any, um, I will check my email. They have my email as well. If um, I can share to anybody that wants to contact me, I'll just write in the chat so you can contact me with any questions. So email on Instagram so you can contact me if needed. Otherwise, thank you. All right. I'll stop my share here. There we go. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we're going to miss seeing the, the weekly flowers from McCrory, or at least I know I will. Uh, we had one question in the Q&A about, uh, will ethylene from tomatoes affect pumpkins? And uh, tomatoes give off less ethylene than, uh, than apples or, or bananas. Um, they will give off a little bit, so it's probably best not to put them, you know, in the same box, but it should be okay if they're separated by a few feet or so. So um, with that, we will get to our creepy crawlies again. And take it away, Amanda. Okay. Yeah, this is always the fun part where I uh have to remember slightly what slides did i send in so uh my first one is some fall flower appreciation and there are some insects hiding in at least two of those pictures but as i've been out tromping around the grasslands and some public land uh, doing some hunting over the past couple of weeks i noticed that there are a bunch of heath asters at least here in the central part of the state that are still very much in full bloom and my hunting buddy gets really annoyed with me because I will stop and take pictures of insects when I'm supposed to be looking for birds or deer or, you know, the things that we're supposed to harvest. But I did, you know, find honeybees out in the middle of some public land using some heath aster and then also a tiger swallowtail. Uh, back on grouse opener. So it's just been really impressive the floral resources that are still out there in the prairies, even though it's been a fairly dry year. Uh, one thing that I do notice walking around is that a lot of these, these flowers are more present in the draws or the low spots that have maybe held on to some more moisture, some more of the limited moisture that we've been getting. So for those of you who might be out hiking or hunting, there are still definitely native plants out there to be keeping an eye on and to watch and see what insects are still active. There was a really awesome robber fly um, on Sunday morning, but my hands were very full with like two packs and a bow and I couldn't take a picture of it, which is, you know, when people say they have no regrets in life, like I have regrets and one of them is not getting a shot of that really awesome fly with like red eyes and it was just enormous. So this is what I do for fun on the weekends, but the heath asters are out. This is also a plant that you can incorporate into your own landscape. It's one that's available from different native plant nurseries as seeds or plant starts. And you can see that it is a prolific late bloomer. And when I'm talking about pollinator habitat creation, I often, you know, and some of you probably have heard me talk about making sure that you've got something blooming during all parts of the season, especially at the beginning of the season and at the end of the season. So if you're looking at your yard right now and thinking, man, I don't have a lot that's blooming out there, 
think about incorporating some asters in your garden next year. I know that I'm going to be definitely putting some more late bloomers into my yard next year because as I've been harvesting the last of my zucchini, I've been noticing that I've had some incomplete pollination issues. So I want to get some more floral resources out there. And I know, you know, the drought in Pierre definitely didn't help anything. So those are some of the things that I'm thinking ahead to as I end the season, you know, not only as a gardener, but as an entomologist. Uh, next slide, please. And, you know, every, everyone, as we approach October, spooky season, um, spiders. I love spiders. I have gotten way more cool with spiders um, the longer I've been working with arthropods. Um, when I was in grad school, I had a roommate who was super cool with spiders. I was not quite to her level yet. And so any spiders that made it out of her room um, got dispatched, but I've come a long way since then. So even if you hate spiders, you, you too can change. Um, I find that with spiders, a lot of people just don't understand their behavior. Um, and so on the bottom right, there's a wolf spider hanging out there on some wheat stubble. Um, and so this is one that I found out in the wild. It was nowhere near a human structure. We were by a sunflower field. So you can see it's actually pretty well camouflaged um, into its you know, kind of natural environment. But these wolf spiders and these other large uh, grass spiders really do want to be outside. Um, we do you know, see them this time of year kind of ending up indoors either by accident or because they think that maybe they'll find a place to overwinter. I find that these spiders were always above what I consider to be my squishability threshold. If something was big enough that it was going to make a mess, if I squished it, I would definitely relocate it to the outdoors. Um, I use the you know inverted container or glass method, sliding that piece of paper underneath and um, scoot it to the outdoors. So if you're seeing wolf spiders in your house, first step is figuring out where they might be getting in. And second step is to just, you know, kindly relocate them. Um, you can see I've got a funnel web spider there in the middle picture, and this is by my back door. Um, it's <laughs> creating its own little Halloween decoration for me, but it's also having a great time eating like all of the red sunflower uh, weevils that get stuck in it and just some little flies and mosquitoes still. I've, I've seen it like come out, you know, grab something out of its web and then run back down into its funnel. So they do a great job of, you know, catching some of those smaller insects that we might consider to be a nuisance or like mosquitoes, things that we might consider to be harmful. So um, if you can start to get cool with, um, you know, some of the spiders living outside doing their thing, um, that will go a long way towards supporting a diverse backyard habitat. Um, and then of course, on the left there, I have my artsy spider shot. It's another one from hunting. Um, I will be, you know, doing things I should be looking for deer and instead I see this like really cool spider silhouetted against the sunset and if you look carefully um, towards the top of the image you can actually see like there's an aphid stuck in its web <laughs> um, so I just have I enjoy spending time outdoors and you know being able you know not only to you know look for insects you know sort of while I'm you know killing time waiting for larger critters uh, can really really be fun for me um, not so much for my hunting buddies they think I'm a little bit weird but spiders you know they can be beautiful um, so they they don't have to be just sort of you know creepy crawly Halloween decoration um, but they do provide a really important ecosystem service and you know, if you're if you're looking sort of for a project or you're like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm cool with insects, like what else is there? I would really recommend uh, learning more about spiders. And my final slide. Oh, we've got a poll. Oh, right. <laughs> my, so the, the poll question that I sort of uh, submitted via email half in jest, the true or false, uh, we have murder hornets in South Dakota. That was possibly um, one of my most frequently asked questions this summer. I would get a lot of samples and the subject line um, would, would be, is this a murder hornet? Or, you know, that would be what was in the voicemail. So for the 15 of you that are still online, if you wanna go ahead and answer the poll and um, Evan, when we've hit a minute or critical mass, we can go ahead and see the results. <laughs> All right then. <laughs> we'll see how many folks have been uh, 
have been on the same weeks that I've been on Garden Hour. All right, in five, four, three, two, one. Last chance if you want to take a guess, people. <laughs> All right. Did we get the results? Yes, we did. Okay. I thought I hit share. It did not share immediately. <laughs> All right, now we got it. Uh, so the answer is uh, false. We do not have murder hornets in South Dakota. So um, there are a couple of you that said true. Uh, we definitely do not have them. Uh, they have not made their way out of sort of the, the little area in Washington and Vancouver where they were sort of initially discovered um, back in 2020. So that's good news. They have not expanded um, their range. So we definitely don't have them in South Dakota. We do have a bunch of other large hymenoptera that people do confuse with murder hornets. Um, so I'm glad people are paying attention, but we'll probably start off our season next year with maybe talking about some of the invasive species that we're more likely to see in South Dakota, um, you know, in the coming years. So we definitely want folks to be on the lookout for funky bugs. And you now know sort of who to contact, um, you know, to, to make some of those reports so that we can start investigating if it is something that is new to South Dakota and that we don't want to be seeing. All right, next slide, please. And I really couldn't pick a cool insect for our last week. So I decided to put together a whole bunch of the pictures from our cool insects over the season. Um, we've got our, you know, our monarch and viceroy from last week bumblebees, the dragonflies, some of the really cool caterpillars people sent me. It was really fun going back through my slides. I had almost forgotten about the eight spotted forester moth that was back in, I think it was either late May or early June. That was one that I had never seen in my yard before. So that was very exciting. And then of course, um, the face bug with the periodical cicada. I gotta say brood 10 cicada experience was one of the highlights of my 2021. And it was really fun just sort of scrolling back through my pictures of those cicadas and just remembering how absolutely phenomenal that experience was. Um, and then in the bottom right there, we've got our cicada killer, which is not a murder hornet. Um, I've had quite a few of those in my backyard this year. And I did just notice sort of a couple of weeks ago that the cicadas, you know, have finally stopped. Um, so even though it was unseasonably warm here, in pier sort of over the weekend and today you know a lot of our true summer insects have ended their season and we are definitely moving into fall so we'll go ahead and oh my caterpillar that was the leafy spurge hawk moth um, that was one that was sent to me by i believe it was a game fish and park uh, it was either game fish and parks or department of ag um, one of their folks shot it to me via email, but a lot of the funky caterpillars that we see, like the really large ones that, you know, almost end up being like the size of a finger, um, hairless, and if they've got that horn on the back of their um, hind ends, those are, <laughs> those are um, going to be caterpillars that are in the sphingity or the sphinx or the hawk moth family. Um, and we've got a lot of those. Um, so like leafy spurge hawk moth, the tomato hornworm turns into um, one of those kinds of moths. And then there's also um, a white lined sphinx moth that we have that has caterpillars that are a similar size and shape um, and have some some color variation across them so there's actually a really cool resource um, it's called discover life and they have kind of an interactive key that you can you know take a caterpillar or its picture and check off like okay does it have a spine what color is it does it have hair and it'll help you kind of narrow down what caterpillar you have so Caterpillar ID, I use that a ton um, because there just are so many and sometimes you don't always see them. But yep, leafy spurge hawk moth. So yeah, so it's been really kind of, it's been fun to go through sort of all the insects that I've been seeing week to week and find things to share with you folks. So hopefully um, for those of you who have been with us throughout the season that you've seen some things to get curious about or maybe appreciate a little bit more. Um, and I hope that as you, 
sort of close out your garden season and start looking towards next year that you maybe like insects a little bit more than you did when you started your garden hour journey. So thanks for being here this year. Um, oh, yep, I see the <laughs> question from Kathy. She found one and that was your ID. So awesome, yay. <laughs> good, good job there. Um, but yeah, I will turn things back over to Rhoda so we can close out our final garden hour of the season. Thank you, Amanda. And I am going to skip back to a slide I uh, skipped over earlier tonight. And that I want to let you all know about the South Dakota Local Foods Conference coming up November 4th through the 6th. It is going to be online again this year. Um, and we've got a lot of fun speakers, a lot of activities going with it. So check it out. Uh, you can look at the South Dakota Specialty Producers.org um, or you can uh, Google or search uh, Eventbrite for the South Dakota Local Foods Conference. You'll find uh, the information there. It's $35 for the three day event. So that's a pretty good bargain. And as you can see, we have a, a, an array of topics here. Um, a speaker, keynote speaker from the Blind Butcher Brewery, which just has to be pretty interesting to, to find out what that's going to be about. Uh, we've got talks on, on protecting our soil, working with the soil, organic production, uh, working with agritourism, if you're ever have thought about doing that yourself, or maybe some friends who are in your area. We're going to be talking about food preservation, chickens, a whole lot more. So uh, check that out November 4th through the 6th, and the registration is open now. And with that, we will go to our our final uh, slide of the evening to talk about what's going to happen with the garden hotline now. Christine, can you fill us in on that? Yeah, I want to remind everybody that the garden hotline is going to continue to be available for you to email or call. So our staff in Rapid City and Sioux Falls, they'll be there until October 21st. So they'll, they'll be able to support you in closing out the gardening season. After that time, our line out of Aberdeen, that email and phone number will be active throughout the entire year. So if you've got questions about houseplants or gardening questions, if you're looking ahead to next year and things you want resolved and puzzled over, you can, um, anyone from anywhere in the state um, can, can contact the garden hotline and we are always happy to help. And as you know, by many of you know by now, the staff work with um, all of us specialists and forward on fun puzzles for us to solve and cool insects to ID and, um, the perplexing vegetable question. So um, just know that that resource continues to be available for you to use. And, you know, thanks for, um, thanks for staying curious. <laughs> and with that, uh, we will wrap up our 2021 uh, Garden Hour series. Uh, remember that you can always find these on YouTube from the SDSU uh, Extension website. Um, and we look forward maybe to seeing you next year. Um, please uh, contact us and let us know what you enjoyed about the series, what you didn't enjoy about the series. Would you like to have a different time, a different format? Um, we're going to be reevaluating how everything went this year and, and see if there are ways that, that we can fine tune it to uh, make it more helpful to you. Um, so we welcome feedback from, from all of you. With that, I'd like to uh, thank our panelists tonight, uh, Christine Lang, Amanda Bachman, and Christina Lind who has been with us nearly every week also. And we thank you for that. And uh, 
with our support staff person, uh, Evan. Thank you for being in the background and making everything work. Yeah, it's been a blast. <laughs> and Evan's been busy typing stuff into the chat, I believe, or somebody has been. So if you were looking for any of those uh, contact information, be sure to check out the chat. And with that, I wish you all a, a good fall. Be sure and get over to McCurry Gardens when you can. Good night, all.